on the screen is a display of the Analog Discovery Network Analyzer. The top half of the screen displays the gain. The yellow line is the input, which you see is constant. The blue line is channel 2, which is the output. I'll show you the circuit in a minute. You'll notice that it starts with a loss, that is down 10 dB, rises to about 6 dB from about 100 Hertz to a little over a kilohertz or around a kilohertz, <clears throat> and then begins to fall off until uh, about 200 kilohertz, at which time the gain starts to go back up again. And this is an anomaly that we will talk about. At the bottom is the phase, that is the phase shift from input to output. You'll notice that it starts out at about 80 degrees, in other words leading. At 1 kilohertz it's about 36 degrees lagging. The crossover point is about uh, 250 hertz. Then the, the phase becomes relatively constant for a while at about minus 90 degrees and then falls off even more near the uh, upper end which is a megahertz. So what is it that we are looking at? Well I told you that this is an analog discovery experiment so let's now look down at first the experiment itself. This is an operational amplifier. It's a UA741 and actually it's a pretty old circuit. This particular operational amplifier is actually from the 1960s. The 741 is the in the TO99 can here and its circuitry is depicted here. <clears throat> that is, it's a simple operational amplifier with an inverting input and a non-inverting input. It has pins for setting the offset null, we'll talk about those in a minute, and pins for the negative voltage and the positive voltage. The can is a little bit unusual, they don't make these anymore. This particular style and this particular amplifier comes from the 1960s and only because I'm a dinosaur from the period of 19, yeah I guess late 1960s, early 1970s and I still have a, a bucket full of those things in my uh, in my collection of antiquated electronics so I decided to use that partly because I wanted to show how a properly sealed integrated circuit can last for dozens of years uh, have no idea what the actual MTBF of that is, but it's been around, like I say, since I think the late 60s, and it's still operating correctly. Uh, if you're trying to duplicate this experiment, you will probably want to use uh, a more modern operational amplifier, and probably one in a, in a dip package or a plastic package of some kind. So now let's move over and take a look at the circuit this is the 741. You may notice that there are 4.7K resistors off pins 1 and 5, which are the offset null. I did that just to hold the output at approximately 0 volts. Uh, you can balance it more uh, properly with a potentiometer, but uh, I, I decided to use this just since it's AC coupled. It doesn't really matter how much the offset is as long as it's small enough that you're not saturating the amplifier at its limits. There is a 20K feedback resistor 
and a 10K input resistor, giving this, this circuit a nominal gain of 2. For balance purposes, I've also put a 10K resistor in the uh, non-inverting input to ground. We're feeding approximately 1 volt in at this point, and we're getting approximately 2 volts out at this point. So how are we getting the frequency response? Well, at the low end, the frequency response is dominated by this capacitor. This capacitor sets the low frequency response because at DC, for example, this has essentially infinite impedance. And infinite impedance compared to 10K means that most of the voltage is dropped across the capacitor and very little across the resistor, so there's not much input. As the frequency reaches the point where uh, RC, 2 pi times RC, where the capacitive reactance and the resistance are approximately equal, well then about half of the signal is getting through. And then of course at higher frequencies this capacitor becomes almost a dead short and all of the signal gets through. If you notice we have a feedback capacitor as well. And that is in part to demonstrate a couple of things. One is how the roll-off of this amplifier, that is its high frequency response, can be varied by bridging a capacitor across the feedback resistor. As the feedback resistor is constant, but the impedance of the feedback capacitor changes with frequency. Once again, as the frequency goes up, this capacitor becomes a bigger and bigger part of this uh, network and essentially feeds back more and more voltage. Of course, since it's negative feedback, that reduces the gain. So, <clears throat> let's go back now to the picture on the display. And talk a little bit more about what's happening out here. This is a fairly normal 20 dB per decade fall off, which is due to the feedback capacitor. However, at approximately this frequency, an interesting phenomenon begins to occur. The output impedance of the integrated circuit of the op amp begins to be a significant part relative to the capacitor. That is, the capacitor starts actually feeding energy back from the input into the output of the op amp. Let's take another look at that. The input signal, normally this input signal would be approximately zero and an idealized op amp it would be. However, an idealized op amp also would have no output impedance. This point will move slightly and as long as this capacitor is a high enough impedance, very little signal is fed through this path. Most of the signal goes through the op amp and, and through its output. But at a sufficiently high frequency, enough signal is coupled through this capacitor and actually drives into the output impedance of this amplifier. If you want to see a little more about this, you might want to go to the Analog Devices website. There are some excellent uh, videos, uh, YouTube videos on their website about this phenomenon and I would recommend that as a supplement to what we're talking about. But the real purpose of this exercise is to talk about the use of the analog discovery and the network analyzer. So we'll do that in the next segment. The network analyzer is, can be found in the analog discovery waveforms program. Waveforms is the software that uh, runs the analog discovery hardware. You can find the network analyzer by clicking on More Instruments. And as you see, the Network Analyzer is the first entry. 
When I click on that, the network analyzer appears and I have put it on this larger display up above. This is actually a high definition television with a with a PC input. <clears throat> and you set up the analog discovery by adjusting a start and stop frequency, any offset in the waveform generator, the amplitude of the signal, I said earlier we're using a volt, the number of steps, in other words how often it uh, samples the input and output to produce these graphs. You also, in this particular case, we're using a Bode scale, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and the scope channels are also set up. I've generally found it's easier to start with the default settings and then modify them to suit your needs. So let's talk a little bit about that. And at the same time, let's also talk about the inputs and outputs of the analog discovery. The wires coming out of the side of the analog discovery are the, anal uh, the arbitrary waveform generator output, that's this yellow wire, a pair of wires for each scope channel, and for example the blue wires are the uh, scope channel 2, the orange wires are the scope channel 1, and by the way I have scope channel 2 inverted, that is I have reversed the positive and negative inputs so that the negative input is on the output of the amplifier. And the reason is this is an inverting amplifier. So by using the inverting amplifier and then reversing the channel 2 connections, I wind up with a phase shift of 0 degrees in the nominal area. One thing about using the network analyzer is it completely takes over oscilloscope channels 1 and 2, as well as arbitrary waveform generator number 1. In other words, if you're using those and you turn on the network analyzer, it will automatically turn off the scope channels, both of them, and one of the waveform generator's channels in order to operate the network analyzer. <clears throat> and that is what you see up here, the arbitrary waveform generator is the orange line, which is also channel 1, as you note up here, of the oscilloscope. It's 1 volt constant. Channel 2 is this trace, and channel uh, the uh, phase trace is also channel 2 relative to channel 1. And something that you will notice is how slow it runs at the very beginning. As it gets up into the higher frequencies it runs much faster. The reason is that at very low frequencies, in this case we're starting at 10 Hertz, it has to wait until there have been enough cycles to go through the circuit and detect the output. Well at 10 Hertz to get 10 cycles you need to wait a second. When you get to 20 Hertz you only need to wait a half a second to get 10 cycles and so on. I don't know exactly what the sample rate is in the analog discovery. It probably tells me somewhere but I haven't found it. But if you assume for example that the sample rate is constant, in other words it needs say 10 samples then down at this end it's going to need a full second to do that first sample, a half a second to do the next sample, uh, a quarter of a second to do the next one and so on. And that's why it runs so slowly at the left hand edge. Now <clears throat> I should point out that network analyzers have been available for a very long time but they've been very very expensive. The analog discovery I paid $150 for the one that I have 
is the first network analyzer that I have seen that is affordable to a hobbyist or an experimenter like myself. I'm, I'm retired at this point, so uh, cost of equipment is, a, is an issue. My last, the last network analyzer I remember using, I know cost more than $10,000. I think it actually cost more than $20,000. And they are extensively used in systems like control systems, power supplies, uh, regulated power supplies, uh, automated control systems, and things like that. Because it's very important to know the, the gain and phase characteristics of a control system. I will not get into that here, that's a completely different topic and a lot more involved, but essentially if the phase gets to 180 degrees before the gain falls to zero, in other words to below unity gain, the system will oscillate. Even if it doesn't get to 180 degrees before it gets to zero, the system, if it gets to 180 eventually, near zero, the system will be unstable. That is, it will have a lot of ringing and other response problems, particularly in a control system. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the capacitor. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this capacitor, the feedback capacitor. I'm going to remove that, but I'll do that while watching the screen. Uh, I'll let it finish this cycle. Remove the capacitor. You see what is happening is we have extended the frequency response out to near 100 kilohertz, at which point it begins to fall off. We also have changed the phase characteristics now, the phase characteristics begin to approach uh, about zero degrees at around 800 hertz or so, and remain at zero out to well beyond 10 kilohertz. The reason, by the way, that we have this phase characteristic, that is a, a leading phase characteristic at the beginning, at the low frequencies, is because of the input capacitor. So this is typical of an AC coupled integrated circuit. At the low frequencies, the input capacitor dominates. Now we could uh, switch this to a DC input, and I may do that in a little bit, in which case we should get a fairly flat response out to some frequency, and essentially zero degrees phase shift from the beginning. <clears throat> the reason that we get a fall off even without the feedback capacitor is because of the frequency response of the amplifier itself, the integrated circuit. The operational amplifier of course has a, a limit, a gain bandwidth limit, and at a gain of two its bandwidth limit is is approximately 100 kilohertz. You can find that on the spec sheet of any integrated circuit what its gain bandwidth product is. The uh, I believe the gain bandwidth product of the 741 is around a megahertz, which means that unity gain, the 3 dB fall off is, is at about. Now I've removed the input capacitor. Uh, effectively, I just shorted it out with a jumper wire. You'll notice that now we get flat response all the way down to DC, or at least in this case it's 10 hertz, but if we were to do it below 10 hertz, we'd find that it goes to DC. And notice that the phase is now zero degrees all the way out to the point where the characteristics of the amplifier itself, that is the operational amplifier 741, begin to take over. And at that point, the gain begins to fall off and the phase begins to shift to negative 90 degrees. Now, you may notice that eventually, at a high enough frequency, the phase gets greater than, 80, uh, than 90 degrees. Uh, 
In fact, it begins to approach 130 or so degrees at 1 megahertz. However, by then, the gain is well below zero. This is the zero dB line. There. And you see that's where the gain falls off. And at that point, the phase is only about minus 72 degrees. So this circuit would be well behaved in a control system. However, if you string a couple of these in a row, that is if you have this circuit driving another circuit, the two circuits phase can contribute enough phase shift since this one contributes more than 100 degrees out at the higher frequencies. And if you had another stage beyond this, you could get up to 200 degrees of phase shift. And if the gain of the systems were, were high enough so that it were still near uh, or above unity gain when the phase shift reached 180 degrees, you would have an unstable system. I go into all of that not because I'm trying to teach you control theory, but I'm trying to demonstrate why a network analyzer is such an important tool in network theory, particularly for control systems. It's also used, or could be useful in, doing such things as measuring the frequency response of an audio amplifier. For example, a stereo amplifier that has good frequency and phase response out to 80 kilohertz would probably be considered high fidelity. A cheap radio begins to fall off at around 2 to 3 kilohertz and by 10 kilohertz there's virtually no output. So once again, a network analyzer can be useful in a variety of areas. Everything from audio amplifier testing to control theory to uh, operational amplifier characterization and so on. I find the network analyzer in the analog discovery to be very easy to use. And I would suggest, if you're interested in some interesting experiments with operational amplifiers, and you have an analog discovery, that you try working with it to study the gain and phase characteristics of a variety of circuits, integrators, differentiators, etc. I'm not going to do that now. If there's enough interest, perhaps we might do that in the future. But for now, the purpose of this video was simply to explain the network analyzer, how it can be used, and the characteristics of the analyzer when it's used in this particular case in an operational amplifier circuit. I hope you got something out of this, and I look forward to seeing you in a future video.